Um, welcome to our next session. We're very excited to have the legendary Peter Molyneux here for an open chat with Dean Takahashi. They will be discussing danger and game design, among other things. Dean is a highly respected writer that I'm sure everyone in this room knows of. He writes for Games Beat at Venture Beat. Um, he's the lead writer there, and his cutting edge conference. <laughs> Is everybody awake? <laughs> His alarming cutting edge conference, Games Beat, <laughs> will be held in San Francisco this September. So uh, turn it over to you, Dean. And sorry for that blast. Oh, it's on, sorry. Yeah. I've been talking to myself. Uh, so thank you for joining us, Peter. Um, you are one of the icons of gaming, and um, uh, Peter has made uh, games like uh, Dungeon Keeper, uh, Black and White, uh, Populous, uh, and Fable. Um, but he left uh, Lionhead Studios in uh, 2012 and sort of left the, uh, the consoles behind there and started 22 Cans, uh, a startup. Uh, he made uh, Curiosity, uh, What's Inside the Cube, and he's in the middle of making Goddess uh, right now with uh, just uh, three game designers uh, in, a, in a team, of, a larger team of 30. Um, he made it into the, uh, the Game Academy's uh, Hall of Fame back in 2004, so uh, it seems like that award was a little premature because uh, Peter seemed to have a lot more to do in his career. Um, and uh, so, I'd like to maybe start it out by uh, asking you, Peter, how, how you've seen the video game industry evolve since you started uh, making games. Well, I mean, it's been an amazing journey, you know, to go from the day, I mean, I've been in the industry doing games since um, the BBC Micro, the Acorn Atom, the uh, Commodore 64, where you were, most of the people in this room at that time were sperms at that time. <laughs> and uh, so, was anyone, you know, did anyone play games on the Commodore 64? If you just, wow, that's pretty playful sperms. <laughs> um, and, you know, we've gone from uh, an industry where we used to, the whole industry used to meet in a room this big. You know, that was the, inc the whole industry. The one end there would be Trip Hawkins, who was starting up this crazy company called Electronic Arts. And the other end, there would be Jez San, who was doing um, Argonaut software. And we've gone from that into this monstrous 50, 60, 70 billion dollar industry. We've gone from home computers to uh, consoles, from consoles to mobile. And in some ways, it seems to have changed incredibly. But in other ways, it's stayed the same. Because we have always, this industry has always tried to solve a simple fundamental problem. And that is how to invent new stuff and engage more and more people. And um, we've, so it's just been this 20 year journey of incredible experiences. But, you know, they, the amount of creativity you have to put in each time kind of remains constant. So what was the biggest uh, game development team you ever had? Uh, the biggest game development team was, uh, well, it was, it was me running uh, Lionhead at its peak was about 305 people. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that was, for me as a creative, one of the most hellish times of my life. It was like, um, you know, normally running a team is like herding cats. This is like, you know, herding the entire African plains. You know, you don't know what people are doing and there's, you know, peop some people over there doing one thing and other thing, people over there doing something else. And you, I found it, we ended up diluting our creative impetus. And uh, that, you know, so that, that was, a nightmare, to be quite frank with you. Uh -huh. Now, um, does it feel, though, like with 30 people that uh, you just don't have enough to do what you, you want to do? 
Well, I mean, the problem is now is that, um, you know, there is this unerring and sort of demanding uh, necessity to grow. And the reason we've got 30 people, we've got, um, if, if I just talk about the, how we break down those people, we've got three main designers, and we need three of them because we need three different minds. So we've got, at the back of the hall here, there's Jack Attridge. He is one of the most crazy, creative. He's into the experience, into what people, if, they, what they're feeling, how it feels to touch things, and he, you know, he doesn't give a shit about schedules, or he doesn't give, you know, he'll just add a feature in, you know, two days from launch. That's on the one side. On the other side, we've got someone called um, Jamie Stowe. He used to be a designer on Assassin's Creed, and he's super logical, and it's all about, you know, the planning side of design. And in the middle, we've got someone like me. And then on the coders, you've got a specialist on this device, and you've got another coder, a specialist on, um, the, you know, the Android version of this, and another coder who's specialist on PC. Because the idea now is, if you've got a team of people, you can't, you haven't got the luxury anymore, the luxury of developing on one platform. Those days, for me, have gone. You know, it was it was a lovely holiday when we developed on console. Super. You know, we could just do one format. We knew what the memory of the machine is. Now we have the real world, where consumers don't give a damn about what device they're playing on, really. They just want to play everywhere. You know, they want to they want to be playing on their console, and then they want to take it, and you know, off to the bus. So that we have, this team is made up of enough people so we can support that multi-format um, that multi-format release, and then you've got a whole army of artists. We're not at the point where you can write it once and run it everywhere, then? It sounds like... Uh, well, you, you, you've got to write... I mean, one, the, the other thing that's changed is, and this is radically changed, we found this already, is that you don't, you don't finish anything. You only, you know, releasing something is just another day of development. And, you know, the, what, what we've done with the uh, game we're developing in now, we went from the, the public exposure of Kickstarter to the even more public exposure of early access. And from those two inputs, we created, we've rewritten, redesigned, and completely reinvented the game we're making. Because, you know, if you've got hundreds of thousands of people playing your game, and you realize that Crikey, you know, our, our assumptions about this game were all wrong. We'll have to change it from A to B. It is literally, you know, changing the, the needle from one end to the other end. You've got to do that. You've just got to be radical and brave. And just because so often in, in development, whether you're developing on one console or you're developing across a lot of things, you kind of say, oh, well, we, there, there's this fatal thing in development where you all kind of meet and you go over a feature and you look at the analytics, not only the analytics about retention analytics, which I'm all for those analytic things, but most analytics don't do the fundamental thing they should. They don't make the game better. They certainly squeeze more money out. Most analytics are about squeezing more money out of a consumer. My point is, can we use analytics to make the game better, to make people enjoy and, and invest more time in the game? So I think and we've got a lot of would-be game designers here. Um, yeah. uh, and you mentioned earlier that you view your role as like a curator of design ideas. So yeah, what, what I mean, that that's, mean? that's the point, is that mm -hmm. you know the last thing so often a game needs is another idea from some crazy old shit like me. You, what you're doing is using those analytics, you're using people's suggestions from Kickstarter, you're using the people's suggestions for early access, and you're saying, you know what, that idea is 10 times better than mine. You know, that idea plus this way of working with, us, uh, that, uh, with that idea is a lot better than mine. And so you end up, as a designer, being a curator, you end up with, you know, a hundred ideas in front of you, and you as a designer has to say, this is the one we're gonna focus on. It's not my idea, it's the community's idea. This is the one we're gonna focus on, and you've gotta have 
a team behind you that are willing to be that reactive. So if you look at something like Goddard's, we implemented one version of it on early access, and then we have totally changed every single motivation in the game. We've completely rewritten the, the simulation side of the game. We have completely changed the what people do and how people do that, and that is because of the feedback and it because of me as a designer saying, you, you know, I, I, I had this idea, it was not right, but this idea over here is much better. So you raised $732,000 on a Kickstarter for Goddess. Um, what, yeah. what has that project sort of uh, been like as a Kickstarter project? It did, and, 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 that, and, and that's the key thing for me about Kickstarter. It's not, unless you're Chris Roberts, which is pretty amazing, um, it, it's there to, to kick it off. You know, 730 people for a year, well, for 18 okay. months, is, is, is gonna be a lot more than 700,000. Um, so, but it does, it kicks the project off. What we chose to do which worked fantastically well, and I can't say you know, enough good words about uh, Steam Early Access. We chose to use that Kickstarter money to take us from the closing of Kickstarter to the launch on Early Access. And the reason we did that was to, you know, to help out with the funding for sure, but we, if you are going to make a game which connects millions of people together, you need hundreds of thousands of people to test and play that game, and that was the, the, the dual reasons for releasing them. I don't know if you all have heard by now that Peter has one of the smoothest voices of anybody on earth, right? right. <laughs> so. uh, that, that's due to the <laughs> simple amount of cigarettes that I smoke. If you want a voice <laughs> like mine, just smoke electronic cigarettes. There yeah. we are, <laughs> the branding there. So, um, so th this mellifluous uh, voice uh, um, has given you this sort of knack for uh, salesmanship. Uh, and then some of your, your internet critics say that's uh, over, been over-promising. Um, so with, with Kickstarter, um, uh, do you feel like you have to sort of rein some of that enthusiasm in a bit and actually sort of give these progress reports along the way of exactly well, what's happening? Or? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in a way, mm -hmm. it's, it's your fault, Dean, that uh, I left <laughs> Microsoft and started mm -hmm. 22 Cans because I wanted to address Mm -hmm. this promises issue. I yeah. wanted to actually go out and say, look, I, you know, I promised, I, it's not a promise I make, this is exactly what I say to the team, is, you know, we're gonna go out and make, you know, reinvent the God game genre as we are now, and, you know, revitalize that God game genre. And um, when you won't go through Kickstarter, it's Im almost impossible to hide, because you're making this contract with the people that pledge. And, and that is a very visible contract. Now with Kickstarter, if anyone's brave enough to enter Kickstarter, there is a couple, there's, there's, there's a few rules that you kind of stumble across. No one kind of tells you this, but you stumble across it. Rule number one is an obvious one. What you're alluding to mm -hmm. is don't promise the earth, the moon, and the sun for $10,000 because you know, you, you can, the temptation is when you go into Kickstarter, the first three days are wonderful and you believe you're a god and, you know, that you, you're, you're kind of, you go in onto a spreadsheet and you say, God, if every day is like day one, then, you know, I'm going to have, you know, suitcases, loads of money arriving at the front door. And then it dips down into this, into this slump where you just feel like you've, you know, I mean, I don't know, you've probably you've been strangling kittens or something, or you've done something horrendous because no one's pledging. And that, that period of time, you're just tempted to say anything, add any feature, just to get that curve to move up. And this is, you can look at this live, you know, it's very scary. Um, so my fir the first rule is don't promise things that you cannot deliver. You've got to have a budget. You know, you've got to say, I'm going to have this much money come in. I'm going to use this much money to do this. And every time you add a feature, that money get, is, is diminished. The second rule is never, ever ask for the money that you actually need. Ask for the money that's going to kick your project off. Because the trouble with Kickstarter is, what's so terrifying about it is their rule, um, which is, if you don't make your target, if you're a pound short, 
you, you, you don't get anything. And so your temptation is to go out there and ask for a million, where actually if you ask for 100,000, then you're much more likely to achieve it because what happens, this amazing thing happens at the end of all the Kickstarter projects, and that is you go from this high number of pledges and it goes into this slump, and then in the last five days, it just picks up. And I was intrigued about this, so I looked at all the people that pledged at the end of the project. And what was, 90% of those people had pledged to more than 10 Kickstarter projects. And what that said to me was that there are, there's a group of people that use Kickstarter as a hobby and that will pledge, you know, keep on pledging money to successful projects because they want the, you know, they want the stuff. So if you have your target low and you exceed your target, you seem like one of those projects that's worth investing in. So keep your target low. Don't absolutely don't overpromise and the last thing is don't panic and you know don't don't run around like a headless chicken panicking and feel like you god we have to work 24 hours a day to get a demo out there just you know stick with your vision and be super clear about it mm -hmm. cool. so th does goddess feel like it's uh, you're back in the days of uh, a populace and sort of um thinking about how you did it back then and and maybe making a a different take on a, a God game, I guess? Well, you know, the, in a way it is like Populous, but maybe not the way you think, mm -hmm. because, you know, Populous was made by myself and someone called Glenn, and we had no idea who we were making this game for. And because we didn't know who we were making it for, it actually ended up being played, not just by the core gamers in those early days, but it was played by a lot wider audience than uh, we ever thought we were. And in a way, making Goddess, we want to, I wanted to be as, as crazy, experimentally, um, insanely inventive as the original populace was back in its day. I mean, if you look at it now, it looks atrocious, but back in its day, it felt like that crazy inventiveness because what, this is the core thing that I feel, is that we are in an, a, a almost blessed position in this industry where all these new gamers, these, these, these people who have never been played a game before, never thought of themselves as gamers, are coming in and they're playing for the first time. And if we don't give them something that's just wonderful, that's just glorious, that's just superb and inventive and fresh and different, they're gonna go away again. They don't care, they're not loyal, they, they, they come in, they try something, and at the moment they're trying the brilliant Candy Crush. No one can deny its brilliance and its juiciness. Uh, and they, you know, they're fantastic Supercell games, but is that it? Can we not take them somewhere else? And, and, and that's what Goddess is trying to do, is trying to say that we can approach things like monetization in a delightful way. It doesn't have to be this caustic, acid-like mechanic. We can ap approach the ability to connect people together in a completely new way, and that's what we're trying to do with Goddess. And I think, you know what, it is unquestioned, and I don't care if you call this a promise. It's not a promise, it's a fact. <laughs> it is unquestionably we're gonna hold you to this one, Peter. wonderful, incredible, delightful, smooth experience that I have ever been involved with. And, uh, you know, everybody who touches it... I didn't even have to push you to do that no. one. <laughs> well, it's just... This is, this is what I'm like when I get into the more office in the morning. It drives the, the, the staff absolutely insane. There's someone from 22 Guns at the back. You can ask him. And he's, he's, he's actually currently got a sniper rifle just mm. getting out of his backpack. Mm. There you go. So um, you've, you've seen free-to-play games evolve. Um, and... Uh, I think you've got some interesting new ideas for how to do it with, with Goddess. Um, yeah. But Dungeon Keeper also came, just came out from EA, and uh, yes. I take it you're, you're not really pleased with the, the way well, they did free to play. I mean, it's on, I, 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 I think pleased is the wrong word. I mean, Dungeon Keeper was made to be, you know, this kind of this new take on, you know, who you are in, in a game. And you're supposed to play the baddie, and you built dungeons, and 
Of course, there was no free to play around there. I mean, for me, is the problem is with Dungeon Geek, there's two big problems. The first is that whenever I reminisce about something, whether it's an old film or whether it's an old game or whether it's an old book, you know, my memories don't really match the reality of the experience. So when I came back to Dungeon Keeper, I, I kind of expected Dungeon Keeper again. I expected a remake. I expected to be able to dig out the dungeon, you know, for free. I expected to be able to fight other players. I expected all of that stuff. And what uh, Mythic and EA did, exceptionally well, I have to say, but they gave me a reinvention for the free-to-play world, where, you know, I, I wanted in Dungeon Keeper to, you know, play and keep on playing, keep on playing and keep on playing. And what they did with free-to-play and what free-to-play does an awful lot of, it crucifies my impatience. It, 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 it just beats me up for being an impatient gamer. And the whole of Dungeon Keeper was designed around you know, you digging out quickly, you building up your imps quickly, you, you know, fighting and then fighting again. And that motivation is hard to match up with the current free-to-play mechanics. So I think they did, it's an exceptional implementation in its look. There's a lot of stuff there that I, I recall from Dungeon Keeper, but the pace of the gameplay I find great. So what's a, a better way to try to do free-to-play? Sorry? What's a better way to do free-to-play uh, in some things? Well, I, I, I think the, well, there's two things. And, and again, you can judge this is something which we've sat down and we, uh, when we're doing Goddess and think, we don't want this free-to-play mechanic. Free-to-play is a wrong word. For a start, there cannot be a term that is less true about the current iterations of free-to-play games. Uh, what we want is a new term. And, um, and that term I would uh, is more like invest to play. And you, you, what you, for me, what, what, and this is going to sound crazy, but this is the way I think about it. I thought a lot about free to play. What really are we doing? We are tempting people to invest. Invest is a very different word, by the way. Invest some of their money into a game. Now, if I walk into a supermarket, supermarkets have refined that tempt you mechanic to a, to a brilliant art form. You know, you walk into a supermarket and the first thing you see is the vegetable aisle, it smells, smells lovely. They walk you past the bread stall and it smells delicious. And they're constantly tempting you all the time to spend some of your money. And there is a there is a skill and a psychology and a motivation to it which has been refined over generations. And what we're doing with consumers, we're taking a huge hammer and we're smashing them with it. And say, you will spend money, otherwise you will not enjoy. <laughs> we're, we're treating our consumers like children. You're a bad person for wanting this early. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to charge you five pounds because you, <laughs> well, because you want it now. Good children have to learn patience. And we're, trying, we're beating our consumers up saying, be patient or pay money. That's not a delightful mechanic. That's not going to get people to invest their money. And what it's doing is the very thing which is inevitable. It's meaning that every consumer approaches one of those games and what's the first thing they say? I'm never going to spend any money on this game. I'm never going to, I'm not going to spend money on this game. That is not true. It's like a supermarket putting, you know, the sanitary products in, in, uh, at the front of their shop. You walk in, it smells of disinfectant. You, wanna, you wouldn't want to go on and buy stuff. And that's what we're doing. That's how crude those mechanics are. There has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. We cannot have the crudity of saying to people, the first thing we teach people in these games is how to speed things up and spend gems. That's insane. <laughs> that is absolutely insane. And so we have gone back and we have asked ourselves, how can we get people to invest in their hobby? And that's all about setting people's minds, the mindset and the motivation. You've got to get that right. Asking people for money is, is a, is, it's not a right. You have to justify it. 
It's not good enough just to, you know, just to be like a sledgehammer. So, and that requires a huge amount of design and analytics and all of that stuff. So what do you think of this indie resurgence and, um, and the challenge that indies face of, of being yeah. sort of like one in a million in the app stores? Yes. Well, <laughs> that's an interesting time to ask that question when you've got um, Flappy Bird around. That is the one in a million shot. I mean, you know, yes, as an indie, it is ha hard. It's always, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's, it's very, very hard, whether you make whatever you're making. But you know what? How many out of those million are real, wonderful lost gems? I truly believe that quality and, and dedication and delightfulness will always shine through. And personally, you know, there's lots of stats about, oh, there's a million apps on these devices and all, and all that stuff. There's, a, there's 999,000 really rubbish apps. Uh, but, but, you know, I don't know many games that are lost gems. I actually know games like um, the brilliant Ico that came out on, on PlayStation, which really wasn't the commercial success it should have been because it was one of the greatest, beaut most beautifully balanced games, which w was kind of a lost gem. I, th I think if you're someone, unfortunately now in this industry, you don't, you, it's very, unless you're a flappy bird, uh, it's very hard to do it a quality experience with less than a substantial team of people. So we, we have to wrap this up soon because Peter's getting a lot of uh, notifications on his iPad here. Um, no, it's just but, saying, uh, um, don't, we have a don't few. over, <laughs> it just comes up and says, don't over promise over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> but we have uh, time for a couple of questions. Uh, so does anybody have a question out there? Questions? Hi, um, I'm just wondering, um, your day-to-day -day job, how does it look? What do you do first on a day and in the middle of the day and afterwards? Like, what, what's precisely the things you do on a day? Well, um, a lot of my time is um, kind of, sp uh, at the moment, it goes in rhythms. So it depends what stage you are in the development. At the moment, it's all about making sure that the polish of the ideas that we put in games goes out to the team. And what I, so what I do most days, I use, um, I use a Mac and I use a hell of a lot of Keynote. I am the world's leading Keynote specialist. And because I don't believe in documentation, and I, you know, if you can't get an idea across to a member of the team um, in, in, you know, just three sentences, the idea is not worth anything. So I, uh, in the morning, I tend to do a playthrough of the game, either write up a spreadsheet of, um, you know, do this and change that, or, uh, and I'll look at the analytics and say, we need to worry about that. But if there's anything more complex to talk about, like for the, at the moment, we've got um, a slight reinterpretation of one of our big mechanics called settlements, then I'll make a keynote doc and that will be pictorially representing the idea because coders and artists will never, and will never read text, but if you can show them a picture and give them an example of what direction their code and art needs to go into. So I spend, you know, I spend three or four hours a day making those keynote files and then the rest of the day kind of rolling that stuff out to the team. Um, and, um, yeah, and being just generally grumpy, to be honest with him. But that, yeah, that's the, the sort awesome. of yeah. Down there, with the There's a question work. back here as well. Um, should we take that? Sure. It was quite quick. Um, you mentioned impatience as being a motivator for people to, uh, to spend money, and you said you have a different way of doing, of motivating yeah. the player. Could you give a specific example how that looks like? That, that, that's pretty hard to do because one, one of the things that we're not doing quite yet is, 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 talking about, is, is talking about that. But suffice to say that I think you've got to start layering in. Don't, don't layer in monetization all at once. You know, it, it really gets on my nerves. For example, in Dungeon Keeper, not that I'm knocking it, is that 
you know, the, almost the first thing I did with one of my imps is just mining out a block that took two days. I mean, that is just, you know, 24, it's just madness. So the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to be subtle about it. You've got to take them through the vegetable aisle and then slowly layer in those, those mechanics. And the word I want to use without, I mean, to show it, I'd have to show it on here, is, is to tempt people to think about being proud about investing. You know, the big problem is with monetization, a lot of monetization, is actually it's a cheat. You know, if I'm playing, you know, whatever, whatever game it is, whether it's, you know, Candy Crush or whether it's um, uh, uh, Clash of Clans, and I spend money, and I'm playing, you know, uh, with a friend who's at the same level, he, they'll turn around to me and say, you cheating bastard, you just, you've spent loads of money. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the wrong way to get consumers into that. So if you can find a way, and without showing you it's hard to actually you know, name it because it's not something that's existed before, if you can find a way that it, doesn't, it, that it isn't empirically a cheat, you know, just like if my, my hobby is cooking, you know, I happen to buy a new kitchen implement, I'm not cheating on cooking, it's just a way of enhancing my cooking. But we're showing all this stuff very, very soon, I and mean, Goddess is, Hopefully, in the next few weeks, goes into a gamma release, so you'll, you know, you'll see that stuff then. <laughs> uh, one, <laughs> one more question. Yeah. Um, thanks for coin term invest to play. I really yeah. like it. Um, and I want to hook into the last question. Is there any place who's thinking? loud about it so that we could read up on that stuff? So is there an exchange about this thought happening somewhere? Uh, I, I, I just think there isn't. I mean, they were not that I know of. And it's, it's just like this is, you know, what we have done in the games industry and what we must continue to do is we cannot just sit down and, and then it just really aggravates me when, when people sit down and say, oh, we know about free to play now. You know, you go on and you look at your retention rate and you've got, and, and you know the idea is wrong when it's got too many acronyms. And you know, oh, it's your RPU multiplied by your DAU multiplied by your retention rate, by your multiple. and I feel like going crazy at them because I can just say, no, because you could, what you're doing with your consumers is you're training them not to spend money. You're burning through them and any game that monetize, and maybe this is me being crazy and hippie-ish, but any game whose main money is made out of the 5% whales, it's hardly a complimentary term, by the way, yeah. uh, whales that spend hundreds of pounds on features that really don't add to their gaming experience, is doomed to failure. And what it means is, well, uh, ultimately, I know there's the games that are making millions and millions and millions of pounds, but burning through those consumers in this le leaky-like sieve, what it ultimately means is that we as an industry have to continue to invent. And, and we have to continue to realize that we want, empirically, we want people to make this their hobby. And we have a chance to really, truly be the thing which we've thought we have been for, for, for countless years now. We've got this stat. And, and it is, we are bigger than the movie industry and the film industry combined. You must have heard that stat. That is bollocks. Mm -hmm. Because in terms of money, yes, because we're like greedy, fat pigs. <laughs> that we will just take as much money out of consumers because we just say, you want to play our game, you pay us 50 pounds. And now we're saying, because that's how much a box copy copy. Now we're saying, you want to play our game? Well, you learn to be patient, otherwise you pay us 100 pounds. And that, that means that we're not, we haven't got millions of people as the music industry has and the film industry have. We aren't the culturally significant things that those two industries are, but we can be. And that's what I find so fascinating. And that's why, personally, I, I love this industry. It's an honor to be in this industry. And I'm more excited and enthusiastic about what is going to happen next over the next five years. 
Very good. Thank you, Peter. Hopefully we are not all doomed here.